For all of recorded history, some people have been trying to dominate and rule over others. On a small scale, sometimes an individual or a gang can control and extort others through outright violence. But on a larger scale, especially since technology has leveled the playing field when it comes to physical combat, being biggest and strongest is not enough. So modern tyrants gain and maintain power, not just through brute thuggery, but through deception and manipulation. Physical control has been replaced by mind control. An aspiring ruler now needs to persuade his potential subjects that it is in their own best interest that he have power, including power over them. The tyrant must convince his victims that their own subjugation is necessary, moral, and legitimate. Government, whether in the form of a dictator, a parliament, a congress, or some other arrangement, is the group of people thought to have the right to rule. In other words, thought to have authority over a certain area. What governments do is issue commands, which they call laws, using force to punish any who disobey. Despite the modern rhetoric and euphemisms, government always means a ruling class. Those in power command, and everyone else either obeys or is punished. But to get people to tolerate such an arrangement, to get the common man to accept what is essentially a master-slave relationship, those who crave dominion have to find ways to get their subjects to condone their own subservience and enslavement. First and foremost, a modern tyrant must create an air of legitimacy around his regime, must convince his subjects that he is a rightful and legitimate authority. At one time, kings insisted that God himself had directly granted them the right to rule. Today, most people scoff at such a claim, while still accepting the more modern excuses for authoritarian domination, which are a lot more involved and complicated, but no more reasonable or rational. Humanity has evolved past the superstition of the divine right of kings, but has yet to evolve past the superstition of the divine right of politicians. Tyrants today have to work harder to deceive the people into accepting the status of obedient subjects, but they still manage to do so most of the time, using a few basic methods of deception, manipulation, and propaganda. In many countries, including the United States, Soviet Russia, and Communist China, Ruling classes have claimed the right to dominate the people based upon constitutions and elections. Even under the most vicious tyrannies, those in power always label their actions as legal and claim to be representing and serving the very people they extort and oppress. As much as people have been taught to revere democracy and associate it with freedom and justice, democratically elected governments have committed more murder than any other institution in the history of the world. Instead of actually empowering the people, Democracy merely gives the people the false impression that they are in charge, and the false notion that, as long as they are allowed to vote, oppression and tyranny will be impossible. History shows otherwise. In reality, elections can be the tyrant's best friend, as they can be used to dupe the people into imagining that they have given their permission and consent to be dominated and controlled. At best, the people are given the choice of who will rule them, but true freedom, being ruled by no one, is never one of the choices in any political election. Even when their ballot choices are selected by the ruling class itself, allowing people to vote can deflect and diffuse their anger and resentment, tricking them into focusing their time and energy on pointless rituals which never achieve freedom, so they don't start disobeying or resisting instead. So many people now view the whole process, the constitution, the form of government, the elections, appointments, and other rituals, as not only legitimate, but sacrosanct, that to condemn the entire game and to identify it for what it is, just the latest excuse for authoritarian domination, is considered blasphemy by many, which shows just how effective the tyrant's propaganda still is at duping the people into accepting and advocating their own subjugation. But simply making a ruling class appear legitimate is not enough. For a regime to grow, each grab for power and each corresponding decrease in individual freedom must be done in the name of good intentions and noble motives. The most effective means of convincing people to give up their freedom and their money to a master is to convince them that if they don't, horrible things will happen, which is why nearly all of politics is based on fear-mongering. A tyrant does not obtain power by making the people afraid of him, but by making people afraid of each other. Even the most vicious tyrannies grew by railing against other threats and injustices, whether real or imagined, and by convincing the people that only by giving government huge amounts of money and power could imminent catastrophe be avoided. And those who seek power not only exploit and exaggerate real problems, but often terrorize the people with make-believe dangers, or intentionally cause problems themselves, just to have an excuse to increase their own power. One very old technique for doing this is known as a false flag operation, where a regime perpetrates acts of unjust violence while making it look as if they were done by some foreign enemy. 
Once the hatred and fear of the people has been stirred up, they almost always eagerly support the authoritarian agenda of those in power. A prime example can be seen in the recently declassified Operation Northwoods documents, which show that top officials and the U.S. military plan to stage fake terrorist attacks in Cuba and on U.S. soil and blame them on the communist regime of Fidel Castro in order to garner public support for a military invasion of Cuba. The basic tactic is not new and has been effectively used for centuries by the authoritarian empires all over the world, and it would be extremely naive to think that such tactics are not still being used today. And there are many other methods governments can use to create a problem and then use that problem as an excuse to demand more money and power for itself in the name of fighting against the very problem it created in the first place. This can be done by engineering an economic collapse, by causing poverty to justify the creation of a welfare state, by creating black markets which lead to increased crime to justify a militarization of the police force, by fueling racial or religious conflicts, and so on. Whatever those in power can do to train the people to be scared of the idea of not having a powerful government around will almost always result in the people welcoming or even demanding violations of their own rights and liberties. Of course there will always be conflict in the world, but government only exacerbates and enhances disputes and problems intentionally, because if the people are not afraid of some threat or danger, real or imagined, they would never have a reason to accept a master over them. Government power does not serve to solve problems. Problems serve as the excuse to create never-ending government power. How many problems can you think of that government has ever fixed? Did the countless laws and billions of dollars end the drug trade? Did it end prostitution? Did it end terrorism? Did it end poverty? When has there been any government program or department which achieved its goal, solved a problem, and was therefore disbanded and repealed? It is never in government's interest to solve problems or eliminate threats because it is always the fear caused by problems and threats which trick the people into tolerating the existence of a ruling class. Another ploy used to convince people to support tyranny is for politicians to seek votes from one group of people by promising to tax or control some other group. Those who seek power intentionally create divisions between rich and poor, black and white, men and women, different religions and cultures, and so on, telling each group that if only they elect the right candidates, their priorities and values can be enacted into law and imposed upon the rest of society. Politicians are masters at exploiting the fact that few can resist the temptation to have their views and beliefs forced onto everyone else. On every possible disagreement or difference in opinion, politicians will offer to use the force of government to legalize one viewpoint and outlaw another. Some voters will cheer for a tax to help the poor, while others will cheer for a tax to fund a police force. The politicians propose one new program or agenda after another, each requiring more money and power for the ruling class and less freedom for the people. If someone thinks that he knows how things should be, some politician will always be there promising that if he is elected, he will make that vision a reality. As long as people view law and government as a legitimate way to control others, why wouldn't each person try to use the democratic process to force his neighbors to behave in certain ways and to fund certain things? Nearly everyone falls into this trap when it is called democracy and painted not only as moral but noble, as participating in the process and doing one's civic duty. The end result of politics is never the perfect society, or even the people getting what they want. The end result is groups of people constantly being played against each other, each side of every dispute asking government to forcibly rob and control the other side, with the only real winners being the political class. Over and over again, the people have ended up enthusiastically advocating their own enslavement, simply because it is so tempting for each person to believe that the world would be what it should be if only authoritarian power was used to serve what he wants and what he believes in. As long as the battle is over whose ideas should be forced on everyone else, freedom and justice always suffer. If the other deceptions fail, the fallback argument of those who seek power is that someone has to be in charge, that there will always be someone at the top, and that the only real question is who it should be. When the people accept this lie and assume that government is just an unavoidable fact of life, they will always end up legitimizing a system of domination by petitioning and voting instead of actually trying to achieve freedom or even knowing what real freedom would look like. Democracy often devolves from being a question of what people actually want and support to an argument over which political party is less corrupt and destructive than the others. As much as people may lament negative campaigning and mudslinging, it works precisely because those who crave power really have no positive vision to offer, so their only recourse is to paint the other politicians as being even worse. 
Many people view their vote not as some empowering positive thing, but as an act of self-defense and an attempt to keep the even worse crook out of power. Whoever you last voted for, did you fully trust and support them or did you just distrust them less than the other person? Distrusted less, okay. definitely. Distrusted them less than the other yeah. person? I think I mostly trusted him, mostly. You mostly not, trusted him? Not all the way, but um, like by a large amount more than the other one. Distrust them less than the other person? Uh, I guess distrust more than the other person. I think I mistrusted him less than the other person. I agree. I have voted against somebody to vote for the one I voted for. Yes, okay. not voted for him. I voted against the other person. I, I guess it was more like a lesser of two evils okay. sort of deal for me. Now for the difficult question. Have any of these methods of manipulation and deception worked on you? Have you accepted the idea that constitutions, elections, and other political rituals gave someone else the right to rule you? Do you view violent aggression as legitimate and righteous when it's called law enforcement? Do you feel a moral obligation to obey whatever commands those in power decide to enact as law? Do you view anyone who disobeys any of these politicians' decrees or refuses to pay tribute to them as being a criminal deserving of punishment? Have you ever willingly sacrificed and surrendered your freedom and the freedom of others based on some politician's promise that if you will only give him control, he will use his power to protect the people from some horrible danger? Have you ever fallen for the temptation to vote for some candidate or political party that promised to use government to force your values and opinions onto others? Or promised to coerce others into funding whatever programs and agendas you think are important? Or maybe you're just resigned to the idea that someone has to be in charge. The government is inevitable, that the political system we have may not be perfect, but is the best we can hope for. So you continue to play the game, vote for the lesser of two evils, and passively and obediently accept the outcome. For millennia, well-intentioned people have been trying to achieve peace and justice through the political process, trying to vote their way to utopia, hoping that if only we had the right form of government, the right set of laws, the right checks and balances, the right people in charge, that society could be what it should be. But to one degree or another, the end result of politics has always been a ruling elite made rich and powerful at the expense of the prosperity and freedom of the people. Tyrants do not create their own power out of thin air. They trick the people into giving it to them. As long as people continue to make the same assumptions, fall for the same deceptions, keep playing the same games, and keep looking for a political solution, they will get the same results. But when people stop falling for the tricks, stop fueling oppression with their money and their obedience, then, and only then, will the cycle of tyranny and oppression end.